I am not a regular scientist at all. I respond when somebody says, I wish they'd invent something to do this or that. And then all the lights go on inside my head. <laughs> That's me, with a bottom second for Mantis. And uh, there it is, flamethrower experiments. Would you like to stand in the middle of the street and take a picture of a flamethrower coming at you? It li life should be fun, shouldn't it? Through your career, you've invented some amazing machines. <laughs> Among the many varied, weird jobs I had was uh, assisting biologists to freeze uh, hamsters and bring them back to life. I thought they'd do it to use high-tech physical methods of freezing and warming uh, so that the animal had the best chance. I had a friend in the Navy on that strange um, laboratory at the top of the hill above Portsmouth. And I said, is there any chance I could borrow a, a continuous wave magnetron from you and do some microwave experiments? He said, oh yes, he said, it's secret, but you can <laughs> borrow it. The simple device that I used was a bit box-like, and there was a timer. There were all the essential parts of a microwave oven, and uh, we'd put these hamsters in it, and. Uh, turn the switch and wait to see what happened. Um, I'd put a lunch in on several occasions. If you were radiated, frozen, and when I say frozen, they were so hard, they were like that wood was um, 10 centimetre microwaves. It wasn't long before it was scurrying around. I think I had the first microwave oven ever. I never patented it. So this is the electron capture yeah, detector. Right. It was then the, the most sensitive detection device in the world. It operates by regarding an electron in its wave configuration, not as a particle, a detector that's incredibly low levels. If you had a certain perfluorocarbon, you could spill it on the floor here from a pint bottle. You could pick it up in Japan a week later. Wow. The head of um, space flight operations for NASA, a guy called Abe Silverstein, wrote to me and said, would I come and, come and uh, work with him? What they badly needed was a little gadget that would go on their tiny rockets, would send a signal that could be sent all the way to Earth quite easily and uh, could detect the kind of things they wanted to look for. And it happens that this fits almost all of those things. And that was at the JPL, is that right? Yes. When I was invited, I went. And that's where you had the, your work, the ideas about Gaia started. That's right. It, it, what happened was that I read a book by that famous physicist, Erwin Schrodinger, called What is Life? Well, that, that was, <laughs> what more could one want if you were looking for life on Mars? The biologists didn't, wouldn't read it. I mean, they didn't like quantum theory or anything like that. And, uh, but I read it. And uh, when the, the main thing that Schrodinger said was uh, the most characteristic quality of life is its tendency to reduce the entropy of the system around it. So I wandered in, in a, to a meeting where a lot of biologists were arguing about the different methods of finding life. And they were mostly sending little bits of gear into the Mojave Desert and um, seeing if they could find life there. Well, they could, but it was Earth-type life and it didn't really mean a damn thing. I started arguing with them. They got very cross. And um, finally one of the senior one called the management and I got called to see a, a guy called uh, McGreblian, Robert McGreblian. He was a senior rocket engineer. And he said, why, why are you upsetting all our biologists? How would you detect life on Mars? I said, I'd look for an entropy reduction. And he laughed and said, well, that, he said, yeah, that's an easy one to say. Um, you've seen that book. He said, well, this is the kind of thing a student would say. 
it, the, it's unless you give me a practical experiment that we could send to Mars that would look for life and find it. I'm not interested. You have until Friday. This was Tuesday. I was a bit worried on Thursday night, and it came to me quite suddenly. It's dead easy. All you have to do is <clears throat> analyse the atmosphere of Mars. And if it's made of gases that react with one another chemically and produce heat or different substances, then its entropy is lower than that of uh, a, a, a simple neutral gas mixture. If you do it to the Earth's atmosphere, you find there's methane and oxygen in the air, and these react together, give heat and different substances. And uh, you could draw the conclusion there must be life on Earth. McGrebian was delighted, so was NASA. Uh, they thought this was a great idea and uh, would be the basis for uh, the experiment that later got called Viking that was sent to Mars in the 70s. There was another key magical invention, which was this. The metal is <clears throat> an alloy of palladium and silver. If you pass a current through this, you can easily heat it to about 200. When it reaches 200, hydrogen gas will go through the walls as if they didn't exist. You could take some surface of Mars, heat it up, put it through the GCMS or, the, or through a gas chromatograph, and then feed it into this pipe. Um, and the hydrogen would entirely vanish, leaving only the things you wanted to know. When I look out at the sky at night and see Mars, I know the two a bit, bits of my hardware on the planet that worked. Not many people can say that. <laughs> not, not many. <laughs> but that, that, in a way, was why I got interested in Gaia, because chemistry and uh, life were clearly very closely connected. And you write about how intuition is really important. We don't know how our brains work very well. One of the greatest handicaps that humans suffered was speech. Speech is linear, it's cause and effect. It sounds logical and reasonable, but it's not very good uh, in true logic because the real universe, or, or cosmos is a better word, doesn't run like that at all. I made a little model called Daisy World, an absolutely solid model. You can't explain it by cause and effect. It explains Gaia in many ways. Do you think that's what annoyed so many scientists about the theory when it was first you first started talking I about it? So. Yes, I think they're, they're not used to thinking uh, outside that box. It's, it's hard to sort of think of an analogy, but if you rely on intuition, don't you get into the trap of um, things like homeopathy and people who are today are talking about not taking vaccines, they would argue that Absolutely. they're relying you're, on you're intuition. You're completely right and I agree with you. But, you see, Gaia wasn't like that. Intuition may have given, brought the idea into my mind, but the models like Daisy World and their follow-up, it was about 70 different species uh, running regulating a huge pile of different things, really complicated. Your new book, Novacine, you talk about the next, well, the Anthropocene is over and yeah. the Novacene has yeah. begun. And it's the idea that uh, artificial intelligences and cyborgs, yeah. the connection of, of chemistry and electronic. And anything else. Um, yeah, well, it, it was really kicked off by AlphaGo, um, the um, application of uh, mathematical modelling in, in a much more constructive way than had been done previously. What's so important about AlphaGo and, and it winning those matches? Why, why is that the moment that it started? It's, it's not a logical cause and effect thing. It, the the the, the programme is, is, in a sense, choosing its own bits and pieces. If that is not the start of life, I'd like to know what is. 
And I see Mr. Darwin hovering in the background there, thinking, right, yeah, now that's going to evolve. You're very optimistic about this new form of life. Yeah. Why are you optimistic when people like Elon Musk are... Well, the, the, the optimistic version is more, more efficient. So you, you, you talk about this idea that they'll want to... The hyper-intelligent beings will want to keep us around like we keep gardens and, and pets. And we keep plants. Well, there are five kingdoms, aren't there? The, the Nova scene will be the new kingdom. So it's a new kingdom of life? Yes. You've lived through the, the first era of artificial intelligence. In the 70s, everyone got very excited about it. We had, when we lived in America for a short while, a Roomba vacuum cleaner. And it's quite fascinating. It would run around the floor, sweep it all up, and when it, its batteries got low, it'd go and find a charging socket. But it was the artificial intelligence of those times. And today's different? Oh, sure it is. The, the difference being that the artificial intelligence today can think for itself. Do you think humans, humanity will get to the point where we actually create these beings and they, will we survive long enough? No, we won't create them. They'll create themselves. Right. Um, we won't destroy ourselves before then? I don't. Well, we don't have long anyway. Uh, I, I agree with Martin Rees. Um, you know, he wrote that book, Our Final Century. Mm -hmm. I think it was a good cause for regarding this as our final century. The, the appearance of these Nova Scene things gives us a chance to get out of it. And you, on balance, think that will happen? You think they'll, they'll, they've got enough I hope time? So. Right. I mean, it won't affect me. I'll be dead by then. But the, um, it, it will certainly affect my children. And you don't have any faith in the ideas of finding life on Mars or, you know, having a, a I backup? I think that's absolute rubbish. I, mean, I know a fair amount about Mars. You don't think we'll move there and start colonies on the moon and Mars? No, I do not. I mean, it, it'd be easier to start colonies on, on Antarctica. Enormously easier uh, than on Mars. I mean, it, 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 I cannot think of a much more inhospitable place. <laughs> I mean, I think Elon Musk is a very clever man. He must be. He wouldn't be so rich. But uh, to want to go and live on Mars is just about as crazy as you could be. He must hate people even more than I do. <laughs> you said he, he, it would be better for him to crash on impact. <laughs> That's right, yes. <laughs> One of the things I wrote about was Moonrise recently and, and the idea of the picturing of Earth from afar. How important are perspectives for understanding climate change and, and how, changing our behaviour? I can see that it is very helpful to a meteorologist to be able to look at the Earth from outside. It's more the idea that astronauts, when they come back and they've seen the Earth, they see how fragile the, the atmosphere is. Yes. And Surely part of Why fragile? Because it's so thin. It's tough as old boots. <laughs> but it looks, I mean, it's it billions, looks thin. Billions of years. But it can't be very fragile. No. And you see, there's a, a word that slips in until it becomes a truth that isn't a truth. And uh, <laughs> they just don't understand it. They like the look of it. It looks good. It's like the view outside here. Uh, it's beautiful. Sandy and I travelled on a helicopter at um, Cape Canaveral with uh, Lovell and he told us about his experience on Apollo 13, you know, the one that had an, an explosion of the oxygen generator. And the, they had sheer misery. I didn't realise that most of the journey for him and his fellow crewmen was that mine, the cabin was minus 30. There was no heating at all. It was just the temperature of space. He said it was absolute hell. It was, a, it was the most moving story. I doubt whether he felt very strongly about the sight of the Earth coming in from mm. space.